Welcome to podcast number 28 in my series, Colonies to Colossus, The Rise of a Giant. In this podcast, we're going to look at the colonial economies. I have heard it said that the only way to make history more boring is to add economics to it. This may be true, but without looking at the economies of the colonies, we can't get a complete picture because the economic system of a society reveals so much about the politics, priorities, and habits of that society and its people. Being part of the British Empire gave the colonies the advantage of being part of a huge global trade network and British military might protected the colonies and their commerce. But British policy stifled the economic development of the colonies and caused colonial resentment, which became one of the themes in the American Revolution. By the time of the American Revolution, American colonists enjoyed one of the highest standards of living anywhere on earth. They were the lowest taxed, least regulated people anywhere. Many of these themes remain an important part of American culture today. Prominent Scottish philosopher and economist Adam Smith said this about the colonies. There are no colonies of which the progress has been more rapid than that of the English in North America. Plenty of good land and liberty to manage their own affairs their own way seem to be the two great causes of the prosperity of all new colonies. Foreigners who visited the colonies were often surprised that such prosperous people could be so defiant against their king. The best place to start to understand the economies of the colonies is in the beliefs of the British government. They believed in a system we call mercantilism, and it was mercantilism that guided policymakers in Britain in constructing their policies towards the colonies. At the core of mercantilist belief was the idea that gold and silver were the basis of a nation's true wealth, and to keep gold and silver from leaving England, the government enacted policies to create a favorable balance of trade so that other nations' gold and silver were flowing into England. The idea was to make sure that other nations were buying more of England's products than England was buying from them. Mercantilist philosophies directly impacted the way the colonies were regulated. Generally, these regulations stifled the economic development of the colonies and were sometimes a source of resentment for colonists. The colonies were seen as a source of raw materials to supply British manufacturers the resources that they needed to produce finished goods that then could be sold to other nations and back to the colonies. The British government passed a series of laws collectively called the Navigation Acts, which regulated the colonial economies in such a way that colonial economic activity wouldn't compete with British economic interests, particularly in the area of manufacturing finished goods. These regulations required that the most lucrative colonial products were required to be transported in English ships to England, where a duty was paid before they could be shipped to foreign ports. These products included tobacco, rice, and indigo. Some economic historians estimate that if the colonists had been allowed to sell their commodities directly to foreign nations, they could have realized up to 50% more profits. Sometimes the British government offered bounties or pay for certain strategic resources. These were supplies that were especially needed by the British Navy and could be produced by the colonies. Such things as tar, pitch, turpentine, tall pine trees for ship masts and yard arms, hemp for ropes, and a few other items that were especially needed by the Navy were encouraged by the British government. Much of these supplies had to be brought to England from Sweden, and they really didn't want Sweden to get the money that could go for this. They'd rather have it going into their colonies, who then could use it to buy British manufactured goods. This was in accordance with mercantilist ideas so that gold and silver weren't flowing out of England into Sweden. In all cases, British policy was designed to protect and promote the economic interests of Britain. Any concerns for colonial economic interests were clearly on the back burner. The colonies were generally and roughly grouped into three geographic regions. As a rule, the further south you went, the more extremes of personal wealth and poverty among the colonists you also encountered. First, we described the New England region, which included New Hampshire, Massachusetts Bay, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and originally it also included Plymouth Colony, which was merged with Massachusetts Bay later. Other than the tall pine trees which the British needed to build their ships, New England didn't really produce any cash crops that the mother country really wanted. New England probably had more commercial interest in the other regions, because whatever farming went on was generally just enough to feed the families that the farmers grew. Because there was no natural aristocracy, a merchant class sprung up that often commanded the respect of other New Englanders and kind of formed a merchant elite in New England. In New England, you found sugar refineries, rum distilleries, and shipyards where they built ships. The people of New England learned that they could make money in the carrying industry. In other words, they could carry other people's merchandise from other colonies and other regions within the British Empire and make good money that way. 
in many ways, New England probably had the broadest middle class, what we might regard as a middle class, than many of the other regions. The middle colonies included New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and sometimes Delaware. Sometimes the middle colony region is often described as having the most balanced economy. You had a mix of agriculture, commercial, and even a little bit of manufacturing thrown in. So it was a harmonious blend. The middle colonies had two of the largest cities in the English-speaking world, New York and Philadelphia. In fact, Philadelphia, on the eve of the Revolution, was the second largest city in the English-speaking world. Like New England, you found sugar refineries and rum distilleries in the middle colonies. Middle colonies also specialized in a certain amount of grain production and milling. Along the Brandywine Creek in Delaware, there were a lot of mills that could grind grain into flour. The middle colonies also featured a certain amount of iron production or an iron industry. I mentioned earlier that the English generally frowned upon allowing manufacturing, especially finished goods in the colonies, because they didn't want these goods to compete with manufacturing in England. But England was tired of buying iron from Sweden, so it made more sense to allow a certain amount of iron production to go on in the colonies. And that iron production went on in the middle colonies. The southern colonies included Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, and sometimes Delaware. In the south, the economy revolved around agricultural production, and the wealthy plantation owners formed a colonial elite, much like the wealthy merchants did in the north. The southern region was much larger than the other two regions. In fact, it was bigger than the other two regions combined. And yet it only had one large city, Charleston in South Carolina, which says a lot about the lack of commercial activity there compared to the other two regions. The richest commodities produced in the 13 colonies were produced in the south. These included rice, indigo, and tobacco, all of which made a lot of money and fortunes could be made if you could find the way to produce them. A fourth region that we must talk about because its e economic situation was completely entangled with the 13 mainland colonies are the English colonies in the West Indies or the Caribbean. These included English colonies in places such as Jamaica, Barbados, and many of the other islands in the Caribbean. Everything that I said about the southern colonies could probably go double for the Caribbean colonies. Not only did they produce rice and indigo, but they also produced one of the most wealth-generating products anywhere in the world, which was sugar. These little islands in the Caribbean were some of the most sought-after and fought-after colonies anywhere in the world because of the fact they could produce sugar. A byproduct of the sugar production process was molasses, much of which was shipped off to New England and the middle colonies to distilleries there where they made rum out of it. The mainland colonies produced wooden staves and barrels, food, ships, and many of the other things that the Caribbean colonies need to continue to exist. So all of these four regions actually were intertwined with their trade with each other and with England as well. The colonial economy was growing and dynamic. Between 1700 and 1774, colonial output and production expanded 12-fold. In 1700, the colonial economy was only 5% of England's, but by 1775, just on the eve of the Revolution, it had grown to one-third of England's economy. By 1775, the colonies had about one-third as many people as England. The colonial population grew much quicker than did Europe's, and marriage was much more frequent in the colonies. Benjamin Franklin predicted that the colonial population would soon surpass England's and that a shift in power would inevitably follow. In the colonies, land was abundant and there was often shortages of labor. In England, the situation was exactly reversed, which may explain why coming to the colonies, despite the tremendous hazards, was such an attractive option for so many English men and women. Generally speaking, all male colonists fell into one of seven categories. They were either family farmers, southern planters, indentured servants, slaves, unskilled laborer, artisans, or merchants. The vast majority were family farmers on a very small scale. They farmed to live on what they produced. If they produced surpluses, it was hard to get them to market. Frequently, these farmers worked for 12 hours a day, although I suspect they probably worked more from sunup till sundown. That seems pretty harsh, but I think it's probably true to say that many of them took breaks during the day. They certainly took breaks for meals and for cider. Sometimes they visited with friends or neighbors. So I don't think it was a constant 12 to 14 hour day of unremitting labor. One of the measures of wealth among colonists was how many pots that they had. New couples or people living on the frontier might only have one pot. So every night they had to cook what basically amounted to a stew, since everything that they were going to eat had to be cooked in that one pot. 
As they became more prosperous, they might be able to afford two or more pots, and that was in a, a way to measure their relative wealth. And though corn was the mainstay of the colonial diet, because it was the grain they all had to eat, they also consumed a high amount of dairy products, which in itself is a measure of wealth, because that probably wasn't common throughout most of the world at that time. I've often thought that the colonies were a empire built on wood. I suppose that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not by much. The colonists had an unlimited supply of wood, and they used it for everything from firewood to making shingles to making casks and barrels, sleighs and wagons. Small farmers could always find ways to supplement their income by making any of these various products and selling them on the market. Because there was so little manufacturing of finished goods in the colonies, which is exactly what British policymakers wanted, they didn't want the colonies making manufactured goods and competing with British manufacturers. If you were a wealthy colonist, you would have to buy any finished products or fine ware from England itself. Wealthy colonists relied on a credit system. This was especially true in the South, where many wealthy plantation owners wanted to buy expensive imported English goods. How the system worked is you hired an agent in London, you gave him a list of things that you wanted to buy, he would purchase them on your behalf, send them back to you, and you would pay him either in money or, or in agricultural products that you were growing, such as tobacco or other things. George Washington participated in this system quite a bit. Many of the things that are still in Mount Vernon were things that he bought in this credit system, including some of the finely sculpted fireplace mantles that still exist in Mount Vernon today. One of the big economic obstacles faced by colonists was the lack of a currency. The British government never did develop a comprehensive plan for a colonial monetary system. We talked earlier about the philosophy of mercantilism, which guided policymakers in London. Under this belief, the view was that gold and silver should never be allowed to leave the country. So there were laws that prohibited the exporting of coins outside of the United Kingdom, including coins that were going to the colonies, including the prohibition of sending coins to the colonies. Colonists often used Spanish coins which came into the colonies, many of which came in from pirates, but they also resorted to bartering commodities with each other. I mentioned in an earlier podcast that in the colonies of Virginia and Maryland, tobacco was used as a medium of exchange. It was literally used like money. In fact, George Washington, when he first took possession of Mount Vernon, had to pay a set sum of pounds of tobacco. I think it was 15,000 pounds a year as kind of a mortgage payment for Mount Vernon. The lack of currency not only stifled commercial development, but it made it difficult at times for the government to pay colonial officials their salaries. In some cases, it almost made it impossible to operate the colonial governments. People were resorting to using their jewelry and other small pieces of precious metals to pay taxes or for other things as well. One of the ways the colonies dealt with this lack of a currency was to print paper money. In fact, the American colonies were some of the first societies in history to print paper money, and they did it out of desperation. Paper money wasn't free-floating like our U.S. dollars are today. Rather, they were backed by future taxes or, in some cases, secured by land. In 1723... The legislature of the New Jersey colony passed a paper money act. And in the preamble to that act, you can kind of hear the desperation. I'll just read a few excerpts here. It says, Whereas many petitions and applications have been made to His Excellency, the governor of this province, by freeholders, merchants, and inhabitants of the same, setting forth that the silver and gold formerly current in this province is almost entirely exported to Great Britain and elsewhere, and thereby the many hardships which His Majesty's good subjects within this colony lie under for want of a currency of money, and taking into their serious consideration the miserable circumstances of the inhabitants of the several counties which they represent for want of a medium of trade or currency of money, and that to pay the small taxes for support of this government, they have been obliged to cut down and pay in their plate, earrings, and other jewels. In 1729, the governor of Maryland wrote home to his superiors in London complaining that the people in Maryland were impatient for some kind of relief in their circumstances and that they needed a currency. He wrote, Money or somewhat to answer its current effects in trade are certainly much wanted here. We may barter between one another our staple tobacco, but to carry on and enlarge our trade abroad and to invite artificers, shipwrights, etc. to settle amongst us, another species of currency and payments seems very desirable. New York, Pennsylvania, etc. are vastly improved in foreign trade as well as home manufacturers by a paper currency. It is that in lieu of specific coin which seems to give life, expedition, and ease to trade and commerce. When one colony issued paper money, neighboring colonies usually used it as money as well until they printed their own money. This was the case in New York, and in 1737, 
New York decided to print its own currency, and the governor of New York, justifying this action, wrote home to his superiors in London, explaining, There was no other possible way of discharging that load of debts which the insufficiency of the former revenue had involved the province in. Trade and navigation had for some years declined, and the merchants of most wealth had chose rather to put their money to interest at 8% than to employ it in trade and shipbuilding. Silver and gold was sent to England as fast as it came into the country to make returns to the merchants who had sent hither to their factors. Paper money was vigorously opposed by British merchants who formed a voting bloc in England that had quite a bit of power. The reason they didn't like paper money was that many colonists owed British merchants money. British merchants expected it to be paid in pounds sterling. The problem with the paper currency was that once you printed it, it began to depreciate almost immediately. So if you were a British merchant and someone owed you 10 pounds sterling, they may pay you that in currency, but it might only be worth 7 or 8 pounds sterling instead. Today we kind of call that inflation. Many merchants in Britain complained that it amounted to kind of a tax. There were frequent attempts to try and compromise. Some of the colonial legislatures proposed that they be allowed to print paper money but not have it be legal tender, meaning that it couldn't be used in payment of debts, or they specifically said that it couldn't be used as legal tender in payment of debts to British merchants. But overall, British authorities were never happy about paper currency. The king frequently sent instructions telling his governors to disallow paper currency and to disallow efforts by the colonial legislatures to manipulate the value of currency. In one set of instructions, the king warned that it is our royal will and pleasure and you are hereby strictly required and commanded under pain of our highest displeasure and of being removed from your government. So governors had to be careful that they didn't allow the colonial legislatures to print paper money too often or they could be in trouble with the king. Despite the disapproval and the prohibitions, all of the colonies printed money frequently. The reason they were able to get away with it was because Britain was so frequently at wars with other colonial powers, such as France and Spain. Colonial legislatures simply informed British officials that if they expected the colonies to raise militia or build forts, they would have to pay for it somehow. And the only way to do that was to print some kind of paper currency. And often British authorities, in fact, in almost every case, they reluctantly agreed to allow the colonies to print their own currency during time of war. Usually it was with the understanding that these currencies could only circulate for a certain time and then had to be retired and destroyed. They didn't want these currencies free floating around forever and ever. Many of the issues that came up during these colonial times regarding paper currency have carried over into the U.S. Constitution. The paper currency that the colonies printed were called bills of credit. The Constitution prohibits the states from emitting bills of credit or of making anything other than gold or silver coin legal tender in the payment of debts. Trade with the Indians was an extremely important part of the colonial economy. During the early stages of colonization, trade with the Indians was vital. The policy of the British government was not only to make money by trading with the Indians, but also to get the Indians to be their allies against other European nations, especially the French. In 1756, the king issued the following instructions to his governor of Virginia, which is in many ways typical of the instructions he gave to all his governors from down in the Caribbean all the way up into New Hampshire and New England. He wrote, And whereas there are several nations, cantons, or tribes of Indians inhabiting the western parts of our said colony under your government, you are upon all occasions to give them all proper encouragement so as to induce them to trade with our subjects in preference to any others of Europe, and to become not only peaceable neighbors, but useful and faithful allies. And you are, with the advice of our council of our said colony, to establish regulations with respect to the trade carried on with the said Indians, as may best conduce to the restriction or prevention of fraud and imposition in those persons by whom such trade is carried on, the War of Independence had important economic consequences on the colonies. Not only did it destroy trade with the Indians, but it also freed the former colonists from the shackles of British policies. Great colonial thinkers such as Thomas Jefferson rejected mercantilism and advocated free trade policies. Independence stimulated new commerce, new industries, and manufacturing. One of the supreme ironies of independence was that taxes were actually higher on the former colonists under their new state governments than they had been under the king. One historian estimates that taxes were as much as 10 times higher after independence. For further reading on this topic, I recommend the following books and articles. The Economy of British America, 1607 to 1789 by John J. McCusker and Russell R. Menard. 
The American Colonies and the British Empire, 1607 to 1763, by Carl Ubelode. The Economy of Colonial America by Edwin J. Perkins. An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Royal Instructions to British Colonial Governors, 1670 to 1776, compiled and edited by Leonard Woods Labory. The Land Bank System in the American Colonies by Theodore Thayer, published in the Journal of Economic History, Volume 13, Number 3, Spring 1953. British Policy and Colonial Money Supply by Curtis Nettles, published in the Economic History Review, Volume 3, Number 2, October 1931. Reconstructing Mercantilism, Consensus and Conflict in British Imperial Economy in the 17th and 18th Centuries by Jonathan Barth, published in the William and Mary Quarterly, Volume 73, Number 3, April 2016. Imperial Regulation of Colonial Paper Money, 1764 to 1773, by Jack M. Soson, published in the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography, Volume 88, Number 2, April 1964. Currency Issues to Overcome Depressions in Delaware, New Jersey, New York, and Maryland, 1715 to 1737, by Richard A. Lester, published in the Journal of Political Economy, Volume 47, Number 2, April 1939. Early Piracy and Colonial Commerce by S. C. Hewson, published in the Swanee Review, Volume 1, Number 1, November 1892. British Statutes in the Emergent Nations of North America, 1606 to 1949, by Elizabeth Gaspar Brown, published in the American Journal of Legal History, Volume 7, Number 2, April 1963.